Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Scotland, episode 27, The Short Reign of King Edgar. So everyone, I am back. I have finally returned from my month of holidays. I had a wonderful time away in Spain, Menorca to be specific, sitting by a beach, reading books, including the famous Witcher series. Now let me tell you something, the TV series really doesn't do the game and book lore justice. I'm a bit of a, a nerd when it comes to The Witcher 3 and the books are amazing and really fit the game very well. TV series, not so much, but what can Henry Cavill do? Anyway, I would really recommend anyone who loves fantasy, Game of Thrones for instance, to give those books a read. Also, yes, as of the time of this recording, Queen Elizabeth II has sadly passed away. I don't wish to dwell on her reign or my opinion on the royal family. I think it's best to keep away from that and keep to our story of Scotland's history for the time being. So sorry for the people that have already asked for my opinion on the matter, but I'm going to keep to the history of Scotland for now. Finally, I am happy to announce I have finished re-recording the very first episode in this podcast series. I'm planning to release the episode within the next week or so, so please head to our Twitter or Facebook group if you wish to know when it's being released. I would really recommend any long-time fan to give it a go, as well as any other early re-recorded episodes, as the quality in both writing and audio will be better. I'll keep you all updated as I go through and redo these earlier episodes, and again, I'll let you know on social media when I've reposted the first episode. Anyway, last time we took a step back and gave a slight update on how warfare is fought in the 11th and 12th century. Before this, we discussed how this was in the early days of the Kingdom of Alba, where warbands and raiding parties formed the main baseline for the army, how armour and weapons varied from person to person, and how the quality of said gear was dependent on your class in society. Well, in last episode, we learnt about the update in the weapons, armour and military tactics of this age, learning about how the kings, lords and nobles never really wanted pitched battles to take place. Instead, they liked sieges, but battles could sometimes never be avoided, and the image of the medieval knight warfare we think of today began to take effect in these times. For more on this, please do give the past episode a listen. Today, though, we return to our story. We last left our chronicle with Edgar coming to the throne of Scotland after his uncle and brother feuded for the throne, ultimately ending with the surviving sons of Malcolm banding together to overthrow their uncle for the second time running and proclaim Edgar king, who was also the current oldest living heir next to Alexander of Margaret and Malcolm. So, let's take a dive into his reign today. It'll be one stop episode for Edgar, sadly, as his reign is short and isn't very well recorded in history. But either way, I will, as always, make it as connected and flowing to the last tale in our story as I can. So, let us begin with King Edgar of Scotland. Edgar was the fourth son of Malcolm III and Margaret of Wessex, and thus the nephew of Donald, half-brother of Duncan II. He was born roughly in 1074, meaning that he was about 33 when he came to the throne in 1097. He was given the epithet the Valiant, though confusingly he is sometimes referred to as Edgar the Peaceable, resulting in him being mixed up with the Anglo-Saxon king who ruled 100 years earlier. Very little is known of Edgar's upbringing up until 1093, when he was apparently besieged in Edinburgh Castle by Donald, along with his younger brothers and Alexander and David. According to John of Forden, they were rescued in part by their uncle, Edgar the Ethelin, who we mentioned in last episode and how he managed to get them out and smuggled them to the English court. This is what John of Forden had to say. Some, indeed, tell us that during the whole of that journey, a cloudy mist was round about all this family, and miraculously sheltered from them the gaze of any of their foes, so that nothing hindered them as they journeyed by land or by sea. He was also known as a bit of a miracle worker. Held by this miraculous mist, Edgar the Ethelin took Edgar and his other nephews to the court of William Rufus, as I mentioned, which was quite a risky tactic given that, as the sons of Margaret of Wessex, they had a claim to the English throne. A knight called Orcor even challenged the Ethelin to a trial by combat for treason, but another knight called Godwin fought on his behalf and killed Orcar, thus clearing his name. What Edgar got up to for the next few years is not entirely clear. 
Edgar apparently accompanied Duncan to Durham in 1094 and witnessed a charter that he released there, but it is not clear if he continued up to Scotland or if he returned to Rufus's court. If he did stay with Duncan, then presumably a few months later Edgar was forced to flee the south for the second time in the space of a year when Donald returned to the throne. In 1095, Rufus took Edgar with him to seat off a rebellion in Northumbria, investing Edgar as King of Scots, though in reality in name only, and gave him command of Lothan in southern Scotland. However, Rufus apparently did not have the resources to spare to support Edgar in actually becoming king until 1097, when he put Edgar the Ethelin in charge of an army, which saw Edmund expelled from Scotland and Donald captured, with Edgar, the Scottish Edgar that is, finally made king. Unfortunately, the details of Edgar's reign are rather sketchy. In 1098, there was some rather ominous arrival of the scene of Magnus Barlex, a powerful king of Norway who raided all through the western isles of Scotland and Ireland. Edgar was said to have come to terms with Magnus, and in return for peace, ceded all Scottish claims to the islands. In 1099, Edgar was back in England, carrying the sword of state for Rufus in a ceremony inaugurating Westminster Hall. While he was away, Donald, surprisingly only imprisoned after 1097, plotted some form of rebellion, but Edgar was able to see it off and this time Donald was out of luck, being blinded and, as of not too surprisingly, result dying in the case. In 1100, William Rufus was killed in a hunting accident and replaced as king by Henry I, who in a bid to short the legitimacy of his kingship married Edgar's sister, Edith, thus making the English and Scottish kings brothers-in-law. It is not clear what impact, if any, this had on Edgar and Scotland at this time, but he did not appear at the English court nor face any rebellion within Scotland. In fact, he does not seem to have done much at all until 1107, when, despite only being 43, he died in Edinburgh. Well, that's it then. That is the story of Edgar, King of Scotland. Tune in next week where we start the First Crusade and... Wait, surely that's not all we can pick up about Edgar and his reign. Surely there is more. Well, if we look at his death, for example, there is contradictory account of his death. Recorded by Orderic Vitales in the 12th century, According to this account, Edgar was killed by his uncle Donald III, while Donald III was killed by Alexander I. This account reports on the death of Malcolm III, King of Scots, great divisions rose among them, as we know, in reference to the succession to the crown. Edgar, the king's eldest son, assumed it is his lawful right, but Donald, King Malcolm's brother, having usurped authority, opposed him with great cruelty, and at the length of the brave youth Edgar, was murdered by his uncle. Alexander I, however, his brother, slew Donald and ascended the throne, being thus the avenger as well as the successor of his brother. Benjamin Hudson dismisses a story as completely false, but its existence points to the circulation of incorrect tales about monarchs of the late 10th century and 11th century. Verses of the prophecy of Bert Chan allude to the murder of another Scottish king. This is what it says. Alas, a king will take sovereignty for four nights and one month. I think it is a grievous that the gales will boast woe to him who celebrates him. A son of the woman of the English, I think it's wretched that his brother will kill him. The English woman is obviously St. Margaret, the consort of Malcolm III, but none of their, her children, male or female, are known to have been killed by one of their own siblings. In fact, they really served together and helped each other ascend the throne without any trouble and all banded together to get rid of their uncle. The confusion probably derives from the murder of their half-sibling, Duncan II of Scotland, son of Malcolm III and his first wife. A note in the annals of Ulster claims that Duncan II was murdered by his brothers, Donald and Edmund. As Duncan had no brothers by those names, the text probably points to his uncle Donald III as we know, and his half-brother Edmund of Scotland who switched sides to his uncle later on. Though later texts identify a noble by the name of male Pieter of Merns as the actual murderer. All we do know is this, in 1098, Edgar signed a treaty with Magnus Barefoot, King of Norway, setting the boundary between Scots and Norwegian claims in the west, ceding the claims of the islands all around Scotland. Edgar's religious foundations included a priory at Collingdon in 1098 and an association with the convent of Durham. 
At Dunfermline Abbey, he sought support from the Asylum of Canterbury with his mother's foundation, from which the monks of Canterbury may have been expelled by Donald, his uncle. But earlier on in his life as well, it seems Edgar may have accompanied his older brother Duncan II on his successful invasion in 1094, and seems to have played some involvement in William Rufus's campaign to put down a northern rebellion in 1095, after which he took control of Lothan, as I mentioned. However, the big successes was when he took the throne from his uncle Donald in 1097. John of Forden provides a typically colourful account in which St Cuthbert, the northern Saxon saint buried at Durham Cathedral, came to Edgar in a dream promising victory. Fear not, my son, for God has pleased to give thee the kingdom, and this shall be taken upon thee when thou shalt have taken my standard with thee from the monastery of Dummerham and set it up against thy adversaries. I shall and help thee, and thy foes shall be scattered, and those that hate thee shall flee before thy face. This is what John of Hornden said, quoting Saint Cuthbert in Edgar's dream. Edgar awoke full of excitement told his namesake uncle Edgar the Ethelin and committed himself and his army to march under the banners of St Cuthbert. As a result, Edgar was victorious. When afterwards the armies met and St Cuthbert's standard was raised aloft, a certain knight of English birth named Robert, the son of aforesaid Godwin and the heir and rival of his father's prowess, being accompanied by only two knights, charged the enemy and slew their mightiest who stood out like champions in front of the line of battle. So before armies had near one another, Donald and his men were put to flight and thus by the favour of God and the merits of St Cuthbert, Edgar happily achieved a bloodless victory. This is the best we have for Edgar in any war, and when you look at it, it's not all that impressive. John of Forden's account suggests that no actual real war went on beyond the champions, and even if this was dismissed as false, the account is designed to indicate Edgar's inherent right to rule. If there was a battle, then it should be Edgar's uncle, the Ethelin, who gets the credit. In the year 1097, King William sent Edgar Ethelin into Scotland with an army to drive out Donald and establish King Malcolm's son Edgar as king, and this also he did. That was from the Chronicle of Melrose. And if the Ethelin gets the credit for the battle, William Rufus was clearly the man pulling the strings. Nothing happened to advance Edgar's cause from 1094 to 1097. Until Rufus could afford to spare some soldiers and, as well as Duncan II, Edgar had to do some homage to Rufus and was invested by him as king, effectively acknowledging Rufus as his superior and by implication England's overlordship regarding Scotland. In 1095, when Edgar was first asserting his claim, he issued a charter which demonstrated he was by no means above sucking up to his powerful ally. I, Edgar, son of Malcolm, King of Scots, holding the whole of the land of Lufan and the Kingdom of Scotland, by gift of my lord William, King of the English, and by inheritance from my father, with consent of my foresaid Lord King William. Perhaps the main criticism of Edgar's martial prowess is the treaty he made with King Magnus Barelegs of Norway, so named due to following the fashion of the Western Islanders in wearing nothing over his legs. Magnus launched a major campaign reasserting Norse dominance over their settlements in Ireland and the Western Isles of Scotland, installing his son as Earl of Orkney before raiding Lewis, Oost and Skye. Rather than take the fight to Magnus, Edgar made a treaty with him in which he ceded the Western Isles in return for Magnus departing in peace, though according to the Orkney saga he gave away more than he bargained for. King Edgar would let him have all the islands off the west coast, which were separated by water, navigable by a ship with the rudder set. With King Magnus reached the Cartai, he had a skiff hauled across the narrow neck of the land of Tarbot, with himself sitting at the helm, and this is how he won the whole of the peninsula. In Edgar's defence, though, he became king after several years of civil war and internal division. With four changes of rulers since 1093, it was unlikely that he had sufficient resources to fight a war over territory that he had, in reality, been out of Scottish control ever since the 9th century. Even more in his defence, this whole escapade may have been invented in the 13th century, when Norway's rule over the islands were threatened by Scotland, and they were keen to discover historical precedent to justify their position. 
There is very little evidence to go on, but worth mentioning is that, as we mentioned two episodes ago about his uncle, Malcolm's brother Donald, after initially imprisoning him in 1097, he then had him killed by blinding in 1099. In Edgar's defence, Donald had sent him into exile in 1093, killed his brother in 1094, and planned a rebellion in 1099, while Edgar's brother Edmund, who allied with Donald, had received mercy by being sent to an English monastery. However, Blinding your rivals is pretty brutal. Despite not being around for very long, chroniclers seem to have had a good impression of Edgar. The Chronicle of Melrose described him as a valiant, while Elred of Ruek, a friend of the family, compared him to his ancestor Edward the Confessor. Sweet and lovable, employing no tyranny, no harshness, no greed against his people, but ruling his subjects with the greatest charity and benevolence. After the chaos of 1093 and 1097, Edgar's reign does not represent a return to stability in Scotland, and the people were probably quite glad to not have been dragged into a war with Magnus Barelegs. While Duncan II had failed to make it to the Christmas and had been harassed by his own subjects, Edgar made a success of his reign and restored the line of Malcolm III. The stability was shown by a return to the politics of his mother, Margaret, writing to the Archbishop of Canterbury to have new monks sent to the Priory of Dunfelm, the old ones presumably having been banished by Donald, as I mentioned, and he made other church grants during his reign as well. Although Edgar's submission to Rufus was not the most dignified of experiences for a Scottish king, it was nevertheless a vital diplomatic encounter which got him onto the throne, and he continued to enjoy the favour from Rufus. When one of Edgar's men in Lofan was imprisoned by the Bishop of Durham, Edgar was able to appeal to Rufus to secure his release, despite being one of Rufus's senior advisers. Similarly, the treaty with Magnus Barelegs ensured peace and stability even if it was not the most glorious of approaches from a military perspective. Perhaps the most intriguing piece of diplomacy, however, was the High King of Ireland, who may have been allied with Magnus Barelegs. Edgar had made peace with Magnus, and he chose a rather bizarre way of improving relations with this High King of Ireland. In this year, the elephant, which is the beast of marvellous bigness, was given by the King of Scotland to the High King of Ireland. How exactly Edgar came to have an elephant in medieval Scotland is not entirely clear. Not many Scots had been on a recent crusade, but perhaps one of them had returned home with a rather sizeable memento. Alternatively, in 1100, Henry I became king in England, and he established a margarine, no meeting between two men in recorded, but it may have well involved an elephant. Or bizarrely, a camel. Apparently a camel is a literal translation, but for some reason historians seem to be pretty convinced that it should be an elephant. Either way, Edgar does not seem to have had any trouble with the High King of Ireland, so presumably he enjoyed his humongous present. Some have criticised Edgar as being too English, or more precisely, too Norman. His seal depicts him in a Norman style, a crowned king with a scepter and orb. The writs and charters that he issued were in the Norman style as well in terms of their phrasing. What's more, Edgar was a child of St. Margaret, and had been expelled by his subjects for being too English for, and only returned thanks to possession of a Norman army. Also, there's actual very little evidence for anything that Edgar did. The seas of St. Andrews and Glasgow remained vacant throughout his reign, so beyond Dunfelm and a spot of elephant gifting, we only really have the absence of events to report. Edgar had no children, and instead named his older brother Alexander as heir. Edgar died in Edinburgh on the 8th of January 1107 AD, and was buried at Dunfelm Abbey. Alexander was acknowledged as his successor, as we said, and came to the throne without civil war. This may be due to Edgar's will also granting his younger brother David, who was younger than Alexander, and would be later known as our famous David I, and a panage in Cumbria, the lands of the former kingdom of Strathclyde, and perhaps also in the southern parts of Lofan. So in short, he managed to give his kingdom to Alexander, but also gave some lands to David I, his younger brother, thus preventing any civil war from taking place. So, that is it, properly this time, for this week. Edgar may have not been a famous Scottish king, but at least he was a stable one during his reign, which prevented the realm from sinking into anarchy.
His brother came to the throne relatively unopposed, and his younger brother David will also have this luxury. It also appears the civil wars of Donald, the un evil uncle, are finally behind us, and this can all be maybe in part to Edgar and his stabilising reign. But really, are the civil wars behind us? We'll have to wait for not next week, but two weeks after that for that answer. As next week we begin one of the most famous wars in European medieval history, the First Crusade. These episodes will be a three-part First Crusade special, where we go over the People's Crusade first, and then we look at the First Crusade in the second episode as a whole, and then finally look at Scotland's participation in the Crusade and any future Crusades going forward in the final episode. This undertaking took place during the final years of Donald's reign and throughout Edgar's reign, so it seems like a perfect time to stop and go over the story. So, deus vult, and be ready for the tale that has probably been told more times than I or any other historian can tell. Thank you again to everyone for the continued support on this series. If you have the time, please do follow our Twitter at the History of SC1, or the History of Scotland in our Facebook group if you wish to discuss the episodes with myself with feedback and comments. As always, any corrections or issues with this podcast, please let me know at historyofscotlandpodcast at gmail.com. That is historyofscotlandpodcast at gmail.com. Please leave a review if you can, and our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and many other great podcasts and sites. Currently, we're hitting massive reviews over on Apple. We've hit around 10 reviews in the UK, averaging around about 4.8, and averaging around 4.7 with 7 reviews in the US. In total on Spotify, however, we've hit an average of 4.9 with 61 reviews, which is an insane number. So thank you so much for all the nice feedback that you've sent me via email or the reviews that you're leaving. It's really nice to see that people are enjoying the story of Scotland's history. Anyway, as I said, next podcast will be next week as normal now. And also keep a lookout for the first episode being redone and re-released. Keep an eye on social media for that. But until then, stay safe. Have a great couple of weeks, guys, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Peace.